that, there's here's this link, here's a survey, and after a while, like I was telling him, I got 27 unread emails right now. You know, we get overloaded, and there's not a real good way to pull it all down to to certain things. Yeah, I know. I mean, I totally agree with that statement. And, you know, it's kind of like what I do. I mean, spine surgery is the same way. I mean, you can find a research paper that says I should, the patient or why to a patient. I mean, there's just, it's just a lot of confusion. I mean, I think it's the same, you know, what you're talking about. And I think what you have to do is pick what you think is the best evidence, you know, and, and then I also think, I think these position statements, you know, one involved with some of this stuff is it's hard to make sweeping generalizations like you always have to remove the pads right like this is the this is the one we're dealing with right now and it's it's not i don't think that's the appropriate way to do things i think just like every patient's different every scenario is different and i think it's your best judgment you know i mean i think we all do these things because we care and you know we're trying to help and protect you know help players or patients and trying to protect them as best we can and you, know, you just use your best judgment i think that's the best advice I can give because we're going to have to make sure we say that again as, as we go live. Officially. Sure. He said we're I live now, but um, yeah. Yeah. And as I, you know, you and I talked about it two years ago at the sports medicine update. About this, And I think for me, the hardest thing is it's, it's from everything we were ever taught. If you're looking at left or whatever, you know, we were taught move as minimal as the fewest number of times as possible whoever's got the, right. the head never let go of the head oh you know, just remove the face mask and i've got some things motion that i'm gonna ask you in a little bit but you know to now say okay i've got the head and you show up and you've got to straddle the patient which we were told never to do and then i'm gonna to have to give up control of the head to you so i can remove the helmet it, it it's, it's not the fear of unknown it's the fear of going against everything we had drilled in our head for so many years so, so you, you're so talking about you're, you're posing you do like the torso elevation technique and remove the pads on the field right is that, is that kind of what you're getting at you know the interesting thing about that is is you know we actually mary beth published the paper on the torso elevation technique and then it was looked at by i think by another group there's another study that shows it's a good safe way to remove pads but in that paper it even says we need, you need to shoot a lateral x-ray of their whole spine before doing this because so say they have a thoracolumbar fracture which aren't uncommon i mean it's less common in football if we're talking about sports and stuff but you know if you had a say a motorcycle accident you know guy down and you're trying to help do so whatever that's a common injury and, and you can't you can't do that until you have an x-ray and prove they don't have that injury right and mary beth even writes that in her paper so I don't think that technique should be done on the field until you have an x-ray. And most places don't. I mean, we have x-ray at the Texan Stadium, but that's, you know, we're a different animal, right? Right. You know, you're not going to have that on high school fields or most collegiate fields. So I don't, I actually don't think that should be done. Um, you know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm somebody treading against probably this paradigm shift a little bit because I think things have been done really well. I've taken care of a couple kids that have had unstable spinal injuries from football and they've done really well and none of them have gotten worse than I knew about. And I think I, I, I'm not a big advocate of change, to be honest with you. Right. So I'm kind of standing by you a little bit, to be honest. Yeah, and, you know, um, and, and that's why the thing has kind of blown up a little bit. And I don't, you know, basically where they tried to make these generalizations, like you have to remove the pads and now it's, they say it's an option. Right. And I think that's a fair way to put it that way. Cause again, it should be your best judgment, right? So if you've got a kid that you're really worried about having cardiopulmonary arrest or something, you know, then, then yeah, of course, remove the pads before they get in the ambulance. And you know, that's the right thing to do. But if you're just worried about a cervical injury, then, you know, the thing to do. Right. And I'm almost of the opinion, let's remove it in the ambulance. So not everybody's having to watch this too. You know, I mean, so there's all kind of, there's, there's so many variables that go with it. So. Right. <laughs> exactly. I mean, the problem with that is a space issue a little bit, but. Right. Um, again, I, I think the biggest issue, the more and more I've thought about this is it really matters who is there, right? Who your help is, who's taught, you know, and, 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 I think what you and I talked about two years ago is the only reason I ever thought about why maybe we should consider having pads and, and stuff removed on the field is because I do think an athletic trainer should be there and available, you know, to help and, and to help, you know, provide patients and to assist, 
you know, but I think maybe then what should happen is athletic trainers should always go to the ER with a patient. I mean, I don't know if that's feasible or not. And that's actually something I thought would be a better plan um, piece on board as well. Right. And, it, and it's, you know, unfortunately, you know, at the tax and jazz, an athletic trainer is going to go with them at, a, at the major college level an athletic trainer is going to go with them. Maybe at some high schools, but in, let's just take this scenario here at Pasadena high school. There's two of them. One of them may be working volleyball. They're not going yeah. to the hospital with that kid. It's going to be a coach. And neither of them obviously are going to be trained. So with that, with no. that being said though, let me ask this. I know you're not going to be able to give a great exact answer on this because everything's independent. We know that forward flexion with an axial load is the problematic mechanism of injury. How, how big of a risk, if for lack of a better way to put it, is equipment, wherever that's occurring, is that head and neck going into some extension, not hyper extreme hyper extension, but some extension, how problematic is that? No, no matter what, with removing equipment, wherever you are. I mean, there's going to be some motion, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the goal is to minimize as much as possible. There's no way of removing all motion at all. I kind of like what you're implying. Um, I, I think, you know, minimal extension is, is fine. I mean, I, I think the problem is, is, you know, the only time I think where extension is really a problem is if somebody's going to take a helmet off and leave the shoulder pads on, right? And everybody's right. taught not to do that. Although I can, I can prove to you that was done in the NFL not too long ago, last season, actually. Um, and there was like a picture of it, which was sort of astonishing, but, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't think it's that bad. And I mean, I've published a paper looking at, you know, colors on and off and it shows there's very little motion. Like we can, we can do a good job. You know, the appropriately trained people do a good job of minimizing motion if there's an unstable injury. Right. What about going into the OR? How much yeah. motion is there to prep that patient for surgery? I mean, you got to intubate them. That's got its own motion involved, but so yeah. So we we did we did we looked at everything. I feel like at this point in time, we did studies looking at different innovation devices. I published a paper in Spine, I think it was in 2012, um, that that's out there that showed there are certain devices that are better than others. Um, you know, and and here, here's here's my overall answer to to all these things that you bring up because they're they're great points. Um, probably happen in my opinion, and this isn't me kind of sitting in my throne, you know, at the top of the medical center in Houston, you know, the busiest trauma center in the country. Like, it's just, to be honest with you, they all ultimately, if we're talking about South Texas, end up at my center anyway, and they probably should. And I think that if we could, you know, because not just me, but like our ER, so Jamie McCarthy, who's one of the concussion docs for the, for the NFL, is the head of the ER, and he's a fantastic guy. He trains all his residents how to remove helmets and shoulder pads. And they all know the same thing that you and I know. We're all on the same page, you know, and, and, and the truth is they're all going to end up here anyway. And I think then we have, you know, we kind of have looked at all these things, you know, I, I guess it's fair to say we are the experts, right? I mean, right. it just is what it is. I mean, you guys are experts, but in, and you guys are all dispersed all over, but up, you know, with the ER doctors and then surgery, you know, in the OR and, and, and all those things like differently here, you know, like I have a special operating room table that, you know, turns the patient, you know, prone that we've, we've written a paper on that and shown that that's the safest way to do that. I mean, you're right. Every little step, there's potential dangers. I think, or I think the ideal scenario is we just kind of bring them here, you know, and, and, and I do think if an athletic trainer can come, that that's a great asset, you know, and really help to the situation. And I mean, I think that's the ideal situation if we're talking about Houston metropolitan area and is there some way we can achieve that? I think the other thing, I mean, this is what happens. So if you look at Philadelphia, if you look at the Northeast, so the other big spinal cord injury center in the country is at Jefferson in Philadelphia. And basically the guy there, his name is Alex McCarl. He's a brilliant spine surgeon. He's worked it so that basically anything like this would end up in their hands, you know, and I think that's probably the right thing. Yeah. I think the other component to this is, is, is I know in talking with, um, medical right now with the, the Super Bowl going on, I was talking to one of our ER physicians, you know, in, at down there and he said that, I know that whatever the national paramedic or EMT involved in some of the, you know, as one of the groups involved in this equipment removal, but they're not necessarily getting the 
to them that this is going to be occurring, you know. So we got to train them too, because I know in places I've been, if they come to the school, it's one EMT service. If we're at yeah. a game, a varsity game, it's a different EMS service and your interaction right. and how you work with each other is totally different. And, and I think that's always going to be the case to a certain extent for everybody to get on the same, at least on the same page, if not the same paragraph would be nice. Yeah, no, I agree. All right, so we had some questions for Dr. Horodaisky, um, but she bring a friend today. And so she actually spoke with Bubba at the joint committee meetings. And um, okay. so Bubba, why don't you kind of give us, give us some of her responses and then we'll uh, hear from Dr. Persarn on some of the same questions. And so um, what is behind the, the change to the removal of face mask to the equipment removal? Well, she and I, he and I have just kind of talked about what she and I talked about and that, that they've been doing the research showing that um, ER personnel in general are not trained in the uh, removal of football equipment or sports equipment in general, you know, if, as it involves any type of helmet. Um, that imaging is not necessarily very good uh, for that. You know, you can see TM, but you're going to get artifact off the nuts and bolts and the different metal in a helmet and shoulder pads. Um, and so, you know, it all kind of stemmed out of that as far as going to equipment on the field plus as he had talked about you know you athletes got a greater chance of you know a cardiac um if they're you know because of that and so that was what she told me when we spoke the other day so dr persarn any other thoughts i think you just said you just covered that so yeah i I mean, the real risk with an upper cervical injury is 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 loss of control of the diaphragm, right? So the so the phrenic nerve comes off, you know, from the C three to five nerve roots, and if they're affected, that you can affect your respiratory drive. Um, you know, I mean, that's why obviously we you know we advocate face mask removal. But it, it, my understanding is a cardiac event is pretty rare. Okay, so one of the big questions that Bubba had was. Um, there wasn't really a demonstration of how this should happen. Do you know discussion of, of, hey, let's put out a video or, hey, let's put out a step-by-step -step action plan? And then if there has been any sort of development like that since then. So, Bubba, As far as I know, there has not. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Bubba. She told me, and, it, and after talking to her, it makes 110% uh, perfect sense in that I, don't, I can't remember how many different associations weren't involved in this, you know, position to remove the equipment. And she said, trying to get all, however many 20 some odd it was to agree, you know, never happens. Um, it's like trying to get a family of four to decide where they want to go eat dinner. And so, but that was, and so they're working on that now, but that's part of one of my big issues with that is, Hey, you need to remove the equipment. Say when able, Okay, but we need to remove the equipment. How are we going to remove the equipment? So if you if you don't know anything about the equipment removal process and what, what they're talking about and what to do, I can go on YouTube and look, and you would not believe at the different options that are out there that people were talking about doing. You've got some people talking about running your hands up the back of the athlete, and I'm cringing going, no, why would we do that? And so I think that also, you know. All right, so wait, I'm going to stop right there. Dr. Prasarn, why is running your hands up the back of an athlete I mean, you. This is to examine the patient. And no, that's why we're no to like go, we're palpating the spine, or what's the reason? They're talking about getting up underneath them to help. Um, while you can remove, while you remove the helmet. So. So the hands are positioned completely behind the patient's back and yes. up under their cervical spine. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not really following why that would be done at all. Because it's a um, terrible idea. Huh? It, it, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I think so. And I, I mean, you know, we know we can remove a helmet safely by, you can reach under the mask, right? So somebody does do that and the helmet comes off and then the official head holder takes the head back. And we, we've looked at that. that. that It doesn't move much. Like it's safe for people. So I don't know why we would suggest doing anything else. 
I'm going, man, you talk about putting somebody in hyperextension, you know, there it is, um, you know, but there's so many things. And I think that, le- that, that aspect as well lent to a lot of the confusion and anger and frustration of, okay, you're telling us we have to do this. I'm by myself. Number one. And number two, how do I do it? You know, um, there was no instruction on how to do it. And I think like anything, well, you just need to do this. Well, great. You've got, you know, you've got a staff of five and and seven doctors on your sideline. Y'all can make it up as you go and be okay. Probably we can't, you know, And, and to me, that was, those were the two biggest frustrating aspects of it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I see where you're coming from, and, and and again, we've talked about this, and I agree with you, you know, wholeheartedly about this. I mean, I'm just not. I, this is the problem with it, with this position statement, and I'm just, again, I'm just, I'm in the same position you are. I, I don't know. Um, I, I don't know if I agree about the whole idea of even having a position statement. I, I think experience has been, we do a good job. You guys do a great job. Um, you know, we haven't had major issues. I mean, other than I guess that one reference to the NFL that I saw, that was by, you know, a professional team. But right. then again, it, it should be a best case scenario. You know, basically, it's you as practitioners use your best judgment based on the situation, who's available to help. You know, it's great to have an, an emergency action plan if you can already have that prepared and ready and, you know, know who's going to be there and, 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 then you're going to, things are going to be done well. And I, I think whoever the injured athlete is, is going to do well. I think add, and, and I think we've introduced some confusion um, with all this and I, I'm just, I'm not sure it's been a good thing. Um, how much, when you do a lateral C-spine in the, and when they're doing a lateral C-spine in the ER, how much can they truly visualize? I mean, that really depends on the individual. So if it's, you know, a wide receiver with a long, thin neck that's very tall, like you can see all the way down to T2 sometimes. You know, so certainly base of the skull down to T2. If it's some huge offensive lineman with no neck, it can be really challenging. Sometimes you can't even see the C4. Do you get a good enough image to make a preliminary, you know, diagnosis and assessment on, and a game plan from there? Or- you know, or is, does it really go down the CT? are going to get a CT scan. Right. Yeah, almost right. everybody's going to get a CT. Okay. I mean, you, conventionally, you're doing an X-ray, and you have to understand that. But realistically, CT has got to be the one. So it, it, you, the, the gear's got to come off to go on the CT because you can't get the artifact because you're not getting a true picture. So, all right. Help. All right. So as we're discussing – versus the college versus here where it may be just me and some of the coaches where best remove that that equipment so is there a list of resources should i go to the websites and train on on those um in your opinion dr prasarn what's the best practices for removing equipment I mean, my understanding is most of the schools have pretty uniform equipment, right? Most of the kids are going to have almost all the same pads. Maybe a few of the positions, like a quarterback, might have a different pair of pads than the rest. Is that is that accurate? Yes. I mean, I mean and, and to be honest with you, the only – like, I, I've removed lots of football pads. You know, I guess, like, we know with and, – and the only organization I'm really involved with is, is the Texans. I do take care of the U of H guys, but I don't go on the field with them. I mean, we know what pads they have. We, we just kind of – we've looked at them all. We know how to remove them. We've rehearsed it. Um, the only other ones I've ever seen were, like, the ripcord ones, and I don't believe those are commonly being used. Is that is that accurate as well? Yeah, they're not very common at all. Um. Hey, this is a guess, so it's probably a better question for you guys. Is I'm guessing the information is from the manufacturers if you want more specifics. Right, it is. Um, I do know, and I couldn't tell you specifically, uh, but I know each each brand of helmet, each manufacturer's helmet for removal is just a touch different. You've got to um, rotate them back off the forehead. Some you can spread the shell and bring them straight off. So really, it, it it does go down to practice. You've got to practice it. Um, I think though the question you need to know that if you're riding in, into the ambulance with the kid to the hospital. But as we kind of talked about from our, my standpoint at first, it's mask off, and then we'll worry about everything else from there. You know. So 
the big the big trick is get the face mask off, and then everything's pretty uniform after that that I've experienced. Like you know, you get the ear pads out, and then yeah, it's really the face mask is the only tricky part that we've seen. We mentioned before that I've had EMS come out, and you know, we've met up with the EM, with our EMS provider, um, but as we kind of sit here and discuss there's not one set of rules for removing equipment or dealing with this um how do i go about my or educating my ems service about look this is the best practice because you have research coming down from you know their medical advisors you're saying you're getting conflicting views based on different techniques Right. So if I'm talking to you and you say, you know, this is for removing a helmet, this is the best strategy for removing pads, but they're having a different standard of care or different, different best practice, then how do we, hey, look, this is, this is the answer. One option is to just kind of look in the medical literature, right, and see, you know, what studies you guys think are the most valuable and, you know, the most accurate and, and based on those. I think, you know, the, the other issue with that is, is every EMS service has a medical director and medical directors have their own way or idea of how they want things to be done. You've got to start the conversation. And I think that's the first piece. And then then it's knowing are they open to the conversation and open to open to training some that are and some that aren't and then you, you've always got your issues we're going to agree to just remove the face mask and not take any of the equipment off but yet when they get there they want to take the helmet off well okay my argument is it's on them now and i'm not going to fight that battle out of a hundred but to start in the conversation there but we do we do have to have out there to show say hey here's here's the current but the, the current thinking on this and here's where it's going working in that direction and you may not agree you know they may not agree that we want to do it this upcoming football season that they want to look at it and practice it but come to a consensus of how we're going to handle it in the interim more. I mean, I think it starts with communication and then I think you have to have a plan and then you have to practice the plan. And I, and I think that produces the best case scenario and the best, the best outcomes. Realistically, uh, I mean, obviously each in individual situation going to best get an athlete to you. I, I, I mean, obviously you said if it's a level one trauma, they're going to send them to you anyways, but what, in your opinion, is going to be best for me on the field to athlete? Basically, I'm just looking for the best practices just as a reminder is, hey, we I talked about it at the very beginning when I was still setting stuff up, but way uh, in, in stabilizing the athlete. As far as like spine boarding techniques or you're, you're asking how to get them to like a trauma center, or I guess. No, because once, the once they get on the spine board, they're more or less EMS and it's just telling them or them going through their process that they have to. So it's more of me as an athletic trainer, the part that I'm I mean, specifically here, dealing with. And I mean, the, the way EMS works you know, an area is, is, is kind of interesting. And to be honest with you, I don't totally understand it. I, I would have to think maybe some sort of, I mean, obviously you're going to examine the player and, I, and I'd have to think some sort of communication with the EMS of, I think this guy has, or clearly they have a neurologic deficit and they have a spinal cord injury. I'd have to think they would, they would, they would understand the most prudent thing they would be to come to one of the level one trauma centers. You know, there's only two, um, you know, and, and the other reason it makes sense is, you know, also because tear is here, right? So if somebody has a spinal cord injury, you know, we have one of the best rehab facilities in the country at our disclosure, disposal right here. Um, I, I mean, I guess the only thing I could recommend is kind of just relaying or emphasizing your recommendation to the EMS crew, you know, that they probably should go to one of the level one trauma centers. Potentially a stable injury. I think from our end, on the field, it's it's fine. Get them in C-spine neutral. Ask. 
figure out what you need from there. You know, um, I, I never, my attitude was always, I never carried a, a spine board or any kind of stretcher. My attitude has always been, if they've got to go to the hospital, they're going in the ambulance anyway, let them use their stuff. There are a few exceptions to that. Now, as I've gotten older, I might, there's a $15 neoprene strap that was invented by one of the NFL athletic trainers to stabilize the helmet onto the backboard that works really, really well. Cause even if, even if it's the helmet's wet, it's going to stay on and stabilize. But other than that, I think th that's the point I'm getting them to. And then as I've made the argument over the last couple of weeks, once, once EMS gets there, we're activating for a higher level of care. Once they get there, they win. They're the higher level of care until they, in my opinion, until they get to the ER of care from them. And so, you know, if they want to remove the helmet, well, at that point we're talking because we're going to remove the shoulder pads and we're going to, we should have obviously already had to try to have that conversation. Sometimes it doesn't work, you know, um, station on a Friday night when you know they're sitting there or we've had a convert, hopefully had a conversation with at least the director way before, but if not, you know, we got to wing it. But I think for us, we get them into supine, we get them in C-spine neutral, we get the face mask off, and we're monitoring the situation from there. That's our job as a primary. You know, what, what, going up to come take care of them from there. Anywhere, Dr. Persson, on that? I think that's for certain your guy's job and, and you know, what needs to be done and, um, I think it's spot on. I'm going to put them on a spine board, you know, carry that on my own, you know, with me and my equipment. Cause I'm not going in no offense to 16 year old high school students. I'm not entrusting them. I'm not entrusting my coaches feel like that's what they need to be doing in that time. That, you know, in my opinion, you activate your emergency action plan at that point, your coaches have a different role and to handle the parents and to open the gates and to do all this other stuff and your kids are assisting with that go get me this go make sure you go to the far end of the parking lot on them they're not trained we can go over it but do you really feel comfortable in the kid that was there that day when it was kind of involved and we did it or the coach to do that in real life i'm not yeah, I mean, I agree. I think that's a setup for disaster. And I, I, the EMS people, that that's their profession and what their their skill and what they're trained to do. And I think you just have to work in concert with them for over a thing. All right. So in in episodes one thirty eight and one thirty nine, that's where you were previously on on the podcast. We discussed uh, the position statement. You guys mentioned it beforehand. How it's how it went from a hard statement to a soft statement. What do you think might be some of the changes that are going to be coming once they release the new recommendations or guidelines for managing the, the spine injured athlete? I mean, I, I think the only thing that's there that's, that's hard and in stone is, is removing the face mask. Um, and and I, I do agree with that. And I think that's the only thing that should be um, thing that gets done or, you know, sort of a hard statement. Um, I, I think the rest, again, is kind of what we talked about at the beginning. I mean, I think it depends on, you know, who you have available to help, you know, their level of expertise. And I think that every injury in patient is different. And I think you have to use your best case judgment. And, you know, that's what we as physicians try to do every day to help take care of patients. And I, I think it's the same. You know, it's the same, you know. All right. Um, well, Dr. Persona, I believe more or less uh, the questions we have for you. So, Bubby, you're about done, huh? Yeah, I don't, I don't think I have anything else. If I do, I know how to get in touch with him. <laughs> All right. Well, on that note. I, I think the only – or thing in closing, I mean, I think all this stuff is really important, right? Like I wouldn't have spent my professional career studying a lot of these things at the time in the lab. And, you know, I, I mean, it, it's, it's something I care about and is important. You know, I think the other thing that maybe I'd like to emphasize, you know, to the audience is really the, so, so we don't have good evidence really clinically, right? That any of this stuff makes a big difference. Right? It's just kind of like we're trying to mi minimize motion as best we can and, and, you know, try to protect the spine. And, you know, that's what we do. The one thing there is great evidence for is 
has uh, unstable spine injury, you know, and, and typically that's some type of dislocation of their neck that the neurologic recovery and that I've seen in clinical practice, the people that I've seen make a miraculous recovery is it's, it's time, okay? So the time to taking the pressure off the spinal cord. And we're not going to be able to do that in the field. I mean, nobody can do that. You know, they have to have a CT first and you're going to do a reduction or take them to the operating room. But all the, there are studies in animals that show if you can take the pressure off the spinal cord within three or four hours, that there's a much greater improvement in neurologic function afterwards. So I'm, you know, I think you have to be careful with what you guys are doing and, and, you know, be expeditious, but safe, obviously. But again, this is kind of why I bring up the bringing them, you know, to a level one trauma center where they're going to get care. I did take care of a kid a couple of years ago that had a, you know, a spear tackling injury, had a unilateral dislocation at C3-4, and he was taken to like a small community hospital first. And so it was probably about a five or six hour delay to getting to me. And then, you know, I rushed in the middle of the night and reduced his neck in the emergency room, you know, but better, you know, or had a different outcome if he'd gone to the right place, you know, more urgently. And I think, you know, that that's something I'd like to kind of emphasize. And that's kind of why, you know, I, I talked before about, you know, maybe it'd be best if we could make sure they go to a level one trauma center, because these community hospitals aren't going to take care of these things. Like their spine surgeons, all they want to do is elective surgery, go home at five o'clock. They don't really have call schedules. They're going to call on me and say in the middle of the night, I don't take care of this. Will you take care of it? I mean, this is the reality, you know, and, and I, I love to take care of these things. You know, that's why I do what I do. Um, the, the other three guys that take call here are the same way. Um, you know, but it's, it's the real thing that I, we have studies and proof of is time. So the best thing you can do is get them to somebody who can take care of these, you know, is, is it able to manage these things in a quick fashion? The majority of the time, I know in the ones I've dealt with, and luckily none of them were horrific at all. They had, you know, they were saying there was no arguing really. And unless, you know, we felt, Hey, this is a CYA one. You know, and then they say, well, okay. But others, they were like, right, we're going downtown. So, you know, they, we knew they were going to a level one trauma center at that point. So the, luckily the time was, the, you know, a long period of time before they got answers and treatment. Only thing we really have evidence to prove makes a difference is time. So, you know, whatever we can do to expeditiously seen by people that are capable, you know, I, I think that's really important. In general, if we suspect a spinal cord injury, we should and recommend a transport to a level one trauma center and or just kind of reiterate and say, hey, you know, this is a spinal injury. Can you take them to a level one? Make sure that um, from there, do that. The amount of time. That yeah, I mean, I, I agree. And maybe that maybe that we should get together and talk to whoever runs EMS. You know, I'm giving a talk in Beaumont tomorrow to a bunch of EMS people, so maybe I'll, I'll bring it up there. Yeah, yeah, they, those need to come see you anyway from there. So, yeah, but we can do that. I'll get with you, I'll get with you on, on doing that educational piece. That would be great. Dr. Mark Persson, if somebody wants to find out more, get a hold of you, uh, I know on your website it's Dr. Mark Persson. Is that right? MarkPersson.com. Yeah, but they can make appointments and stuff through there also, yep. Yeah, and it's got a ton of information, more information. It probably would have taken longer to read all your bio than it would have done to, to do this <laughs> podcast. So, there. Um, and then, is there a best way to get a hold of you? Maybe are you like active on Twitter uh, or something like that? I think I have Facebook now. Facebook? Yeah, it's and it's linked, it's linked through that website also, yeah. Okay. All right. So, you can find him on Facebook through his website, drmarkpersarn.com where you can schedule appointments, you can find out more, read some about his philanthropy or any of that stuff, uh, catch up on some of the written about spine, spine movement, spine injuries, that kind of thing. Um, and so it's sportsmedicinebroadcast.com slash equipment removal. Again, sportsmedicinebroadcast.com slash equipment removal. He's also, Dr. Persarn's also been on episode 138 and 139. So check out those, a lot of the same message. But my big takeaway is if I think it's a, sp a spinal cord injury, then I need to activate EMS and send them to a level one trauma center so that they can reduce that time because a less than four hour time frame is most beneficial, most uh, scientifically shown to have a positive 
Yep. Couldn't agree more. All right. Well, for Jeremy, Mark Persson, Sports Medicine Broadcast, that. Darn. All right. Are we still live? Sorry. I think he's off now. Okay. Uh, if anybody's still listening and you have research articles about this and position statements and anything else you want to flood Jeremy's inbox with, feel free and then he'll get it all to me. So All my contact information is on sportsmedicinebroadcast.com. So sportsmedicinebroadcast.com. Let me know and then I'll get that information over to Bubba. Uh, also... Coming up, NATA month, March, we'll be doing a lot of podcasts. We're also working on getting some prizes to give away. So be ready to join us live, to participate, to interact on Twitter or Facebook or any of the other ways there. NATA Houston 2017, I'm going to be around the Frio Hydration booth there. I'm sure I'll have Bubba helping me do some interviews there. So I will be there. It'll be lots of fun. Look for me. I look forward to meeting each and every person that listens to the show that's participated and is there at the convention in Houston 2017. All right, now we can stop all.